So good afternoon, everybody. Here we are again, World War II TV. I'm Paul Woodadge. We are ready for an exciting afternoon of battlefield deliberations and uh, out on the site south of Cos. So with me today, um, our key historian is David O'Keefe, joining us from Canada. Good afternoon for me. Good morning to you, though. Well, good morning. Good afternoon. And out on the site, of course, we have our regular team of Mag and Duncan currently with their cameras. Colin is driving and will join in later on. And we're going to just have to hope that the weather plays ball because it's been a little bit iffy today. But actually, overcast is kind of good for TV and not entirely inauthentic. So we'll just hope for the best sure. and it'll be fine. We'll, we'll work it out. So what we're talking about today is Operation Spring south of Caen. 76 years ago today and um a pretty tragic day for the canadian army and david of course will be filling in all the details about ba that based of course on his brilliant book which i shall hold up there seven days in hell the black watch snipers it's not just about snipers um it's about the whole regiment and about the context of the of the battle and he's also written about dieppe and professor of history and you name it he can talk about it with a canadian focus so that will be fantastic and we are starting at point 67. Just show you the, those watching what we're an image to show you of where we're going to be today. So this is a Google Earth image I prepared a couple of days ago, and it shows us our circuit we're going to be at today. Um, so I'll zoom on it there. And we are starting up here at where it says point 67, which is the official memorial to the operation we're talking about. And they're going to be heading off south and around Hill 61. Uh, stopping at this lay-by we've worked out here down towards Saint Martin de, uh, sorry, Fontenay Le Marmion up through Mesa on and do this kind of loop around the battlefield here with their um, expert narration. So that's what we're doing. And we've got David's PowerPoint presentation, or rather a shortened version of it, to use for illustration. So we should be good. Everything should be fantastic. So we'll start with the um with Mag's image, I think, because um Mag is showing us the view north towards Caen. So if you watched mm. the Operation Charmwood shows I did a few days ago, that building to the right of Mag's image, if you can just pan around a slide to the right, Mag, that big, that big building in the background beyond the pylon is the Shu, the uh, hospital of Caen, which was the same building we could see in the Suffolk's video, Chateau de Lon, the same building we could see in Charmwood. It is for all the tour guides and visitors to Normandy, the one way of locating the city of Caen. And you can also, on a clear day with a good camera, see Abbe Ozon, which we covered in the second show about Charmwood a few days ago. So that's the view showing how relatively close we are to comedy. It also gets the idea that we're on a bit of high ground here. And I'll bring David in very shortly to, to explain the high ground. I'll switch to um, Duncan's view because Duncan is actually at the memorial and is showing us around from point 67. So, David... Um, Operation Spring, in, in rough terms, what's it all about? What's the, what's the purpose? Well, I guess for many years it's been so controversial. A lot of people have thought it was a breakout attempt to follow Goodwood or that maybe it was just simply a sacrificial holding attack, which unfortunately a lot of the historiography after the war ended up portraying it at. Um, in reality, it was kind of uh, in between. It was, first of all, evolutionary in nature. It started off being planned on late on the 19th, early 20th, and it was indeed a continuation of a breakout. But when things changed in the German line along Barrier Ridge ahead of you, started to congeal, that's when the operation started to change a little bit, actually quite a bit. And uh, Montgomery, General Bernard Law Montgomery, um, who was quite famous for his colossal cracks theory, the idea that kind of like a boxer, you would get into a ring, you would use your jab quite a bit to loosen up your opponent before you nail him with a roundhouse and knock him out. He decided that the knockout blow that he attempted at Goodwood would not work again in the immediate aftermath. A lot of that had to do with the German front line uh, strengthening and bad weather, which had come in. So as a result, he decided to shift gears and he figured the only way he was gonna soften up his German opponent on Varia Ridge was to engage in a series of attritional battles, small, almost like World War I bite and hold tactics, where you would grab some commanding ground and make the Germans pay a heavy price to take it back. So Operation Spring, which eventually goes into action on the 25th, it was originally scheduled for the 23rd and delayed, is essentially that. It's a battle of attrition. The idea is to, you know, turn the line or turn the flank of the first SS which is dug in uh, on Varia Ridge, 
um, get behind it, imperil it, and then use that as bait to draw German panzers into a counterattack. And then, of course, you would use the fact that you've captured an area ridge against the Germans. So we're talking about a, a you know, a, 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 a battle that's designed kind of like a mini Verdun in reverse to be mm. able to grind down the German panzer reserves and create the conditions for a breakthrough, which eventually does come. And we're talking about a lot of things happening in a kind of short space of time in that the June and early July was sort of typified by a rather static um, campaign. And then suddenly you get all these things because this is happening at the same time as Cobra is about to happen. Blue Coat yeah. comes up behind. Coat Goodwood's just occurred. Uh, the Germans launch Operation Lutich in a, in a you know, few days' time. So suddenly all these things are happening at the same time. And we tend to, as historians, look them all with the results of the, pre the next one known already. So we kind of compare them as a series of of, of connected operations, which of course they are, but they also um, are, are discussed in their own right, as you say very, very correctly, that spring is seen as, a, is it an offensive? Is it a, is it a, a attempt to break out? Is it a holding operation? Is it just simply to contain German armor to be, to keep them away from Operation Cobra over to the West? It's all of those things and, and, and we'll discuss it during the course of the day. But uh, you know the score, those watching, we're not going to particularly focus on the whole operation because it would be too unwieldy to cover the whole operation in one hour and a half show. So we're focusing really on the Black Watch. That's a Canadian Black Watch. So we can focus on one unit and kind of get a sense of what their role was and what happened to them and we'll use our camera teams out of the site. So there, that image we've got now is Mag's wonderful image of the Point 67 monument. So that is in... Uh, saint honor de Lorne, just a bit south of Caen, there's a big maple leaf surround there, and they've added various things to that monument over the last few years. In fact, even since David was here last, they've added mm. a 25-pounder and an information panel about artillery. And we've got great views. I mean, let's hope the weather stays as it is. That's a great view there. And there's monuments around there to the various regiments, the, the, not just the infantry of the line regiments, but there's mm. plaques to the engineers and the REMI and the Royal Army Service Corps and all the other support units and, and artillery, which Armor. of course is yeah. a key part of any operation in July is the massed strength of the allied agras, the, uh, the, the huge yeah. amounts of artillery we have at our disposal. So what's Dun Duncan is, is just kind of panning around. So that's the view kind of south. That's our battlefield we're looking at there. There's yeah. a road that goes straight down south. I'll show that image again. That is our kind of our, our, our axis point. See on the left of the image here, there's that southerly moving road there that goes from uh, San Martin de Fontenay through a uh, suburb of San Martin, uh, the city of Lamine, through Mesa or and over here at the bottom right. Fontenay, Fontenay Le Marmion. So where Duncan is and Mag is, they're looking south across these fields here. And of course, with a Google Earth image, it's impossible to see uh, elevation and contours and contour lines. That's, of course, why we've got the teams out there to show that ground. Because when you drive past these sites, the, the elevation changes aren't particularly um, huge. But when you're fighting across them, as David will explain later, little ridges and little depressions can make huge amounts of difference. And um, that's what we'll be, you know, talking about at, at later on. So um, while we're here, um, in terms of the the overview, give a give a rundown of which units are the, the two uh, two divisions involved in this, and the, the sort of yeah. the combined strength of the Canadian forces at start of play on July twenty fifth. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things that I think we see that is a mistake, believe it or not, in the historiography is a lot of people think that this was a Canadian Army operation. Uh, First Canadian Army indeed becomes operational in Normandy on July 23rd, but they're up around Tror, and they're just basically in a holding position. This is an operation that's carried out by Second Canadian Corps, who's operating under Second British Army at the time. So you have Montgomery, Dempsey, who's the commander of Second Army, and Guy Simmons, who is the Second Canadian Corps commander. Um, under that, you have uh, four divisions and an armored brigade that are working with uh, 2nd Canadian Corps at this time. Corps, of course, you know, you can move your divisions around depending on what you need. So in this case, you've got the 2nd Canadian Division, which is now entering its, well, sort of, I guess you could say its first major battle, if you will, since it was decimated at the F two years before. And it's going to join the 3rd Canadian Division, which, of course, landed on D-Day on Juno Beach and has now been locked in mortal combat for, by this time, almost uh, getting near two months. And um, it's going to be, they're going to be joined 
by the British 7th Armoured, famed Desert Rats, and the Guards Armoured Division. And of course, the uh, Canadian Infantry is supported by the 2nd uh, Canadian Armoured Brigade, units in the 2nd Canadian Armoured Brigade, who have been fighting, again, like 3rd Canadian Division, right from... And, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that. We're talking about the artillery. Um, and, you know, we're talking about probably over around 1,500 guns, all different caliber that are in support of this operation. And I'm so happy to see that they finally have something there to represent the artillery, because a lot of people fail to realize that this is one of the greatest artillery duels that we have seen in all of Normandy. Because not only do you have, like you were mentioning, the Agris from 21st Army Group and all the core artillery um, that you can find in Second Army to bring to bear uh, over the days leading up to Operation Spring, but you also have whatever the Germans can bring to the table from two SS Panzer divisions, which are straddling the Orne River. So you've got the first SS, which is right in front, and the second SS Panzer Corps, which are right across. So one of the things that became clear when I was doing the book was taking a look at um, the amount of expenditure just of shells on a daily basis, when you go into the statistics at the time, completely eclipsed El Alamein. So that kind of gives you the perspective. They're dumping 750 rounds per day per gun to be fired off. That is extraordinary. And you have the, you know, the Royal Canadian Service Corps and the British Service Corps working overtime, you know, driving from the dumps to continue to feed the guns. So that is something that's kind of slipped under um, within the historiography, which is absolutely amazing when you think about it. But, uh, we're, we've been dealing with it in the shows I've been doing. Each time as we're building through the operation, we give the artillery figures. They seem amazing. But by the time I get to the next show, they've increased already because what we were able to put into the battle in early June, mid-June is nothing compared to what we can put in the battle now in July. And it kind of increases as the war goes on. So it almost becomes telephone number figures, you know, 10 kajillion and kajillion rounds being fired. And it's just hard to, to take it on board. Well, there's that wonderful images Mag is providing us there of the um, 25 pound, the next Irish army one, which Colin, our other guide, our cameraman is very pleased about Colin being Irish. So the uh, 25 pound are used around the world, uh, probably still being used around the world and probably the, one of the, the best artillery pieces of World War II. Of course, that's at the small end of what the Allies were able to bring down in Operation sure. Like Spring. I mean, it goes yeah. up and up to the 3.7s and the 5.5s and mm -hmm. but the 25 pound are there. Um, an absolute classic and there's an information panel there showing how artillery works you know just in broad terms and breaks down all the various canadian regiments involved and um you know artillery is a as david said there, an important thoroughly important arm of in 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 monty's arsenal because it's better to use steel than it is flesh that was basically his principle yeah yeah without um, a doubt and, and one thing that's really important is remember that you know the fire plans are the you know the drummers of the band they set the beat and yeah. everything ease off the fire plan, particularly in Montgomery's army and or armies, and uh, particularly for Guy Simmons, who was a Montgomery protege. He's a gunner. He believes in the strength of firepower and as an architect, if you will, for the design of all his plans. You don't advance further than your artillery umbrella. And in many cases, it's hard to argue with that, given what the Germans could bring to the table in response. It makes perfect sense have massive artillery support and the ability to call in uh, that artillery support at a given moment. Well, I'm going to keep you on the four screens for a few seconds. We're getting our first idea with those two images there of just how open the wheat fields are um, mm. south of Corn. how uh, we've said this on other shows, how different this is to the bocage of the American sector. You know, last week we were doing our San Lo shows, which were a few days early chronologically, and it's all confined hedgerows and hedgerow lanes and sunken lanes and, and grassy green and the photos I took in our recce two or three days ago, when I came back and looked at them, it looked like New Mexico or Arizona. Everything was yellow and cream, you know, yeah. and a lot less green. And just when we get Colin and Duncan out in these fields later on, the exposure, the the feeling of isolation, in these, yeah. these, you know, you drive past them, and it's just two minutes you've driven down these villages. But when you're standing there in these fields, it is, it, it's a sight to behold. So um we'll be having the camera team start to move on soon because we you know we've got a lot to cover today and we'll have them do a, what they're gonna do next essentially is drive the entire battlefield for us so mm -hmm. we get an idea watching of just 
um, the, the, the relatively small side of the battlefield, but yet how open it is. And there's this mag, I'll put it on mag's image there for a second, just showing how, what they've done to explain about artillery there. And, um, you know, my grandfather was an artilleryman, never left, never left England. He was always anti-aircraft. In fact, he was in, uh, um, uh, balloons and what have you, but, um, and searchlights but yeah the 25 pound and we'll talk about separate self-propelled guns we'll talk about the german self-propelled guns and their artillery they were able to bring into bear later on but right now um because we don't want to get bogged down too much in in the in the operation at this site we'll have the guys move on and while they're driving david will give more details about the setup of the operation and then we'll we'll um we'll go from there so we've we've, we've got everything planned um we will it's all working well so far um so thank you excellent guy excellent camera work there and for those watching of course if just visit these battlefields we can't say mm. it enough you know get out there and, and yeah. see these places and of course you can follow along with us on world war ii tv yeah. but nothing like actually seeing the site for yourself so um thank you guys we'll have you colin drive you off and we'll go to that second position um the lay by where we can kind of talk about what the black watch have been doing in a few days before um, Operation Spring and David will fill a bit more details in about mm. the operation. So brilliant work, uh, guys. I'm going to share um, David's PowerPoint um, document again. So there's other things we want to talk about the setting up of yeah. this. David's done this wonderful preparation. So it'd be stupid not to use it. So um, uh, these are some of the figures we were talking about that David mm. mentioned there, Guy Simmons, and um, one of my favorite generals of, of the Normandy campaign, I have to say. Um, Seems to learn from his mistakes quite quickly compared to some. I don't know what your feelings are about that on that, David, but um, he does. But he does make some serious mistakes. Of course, it's, yeah. it's a steep learning curve. I mean, it's you know, it's 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 uh, you know, the British and Canadian points of view are interesting. And this is the this is mm. our battlefield. This is the overview yeah. here. So, I mean, we're not, as I said, we're not covering all of this. We're just covering the, a relatively small part of it. And very yeah, Ridge. Is, is this feature that is sort of dominating of the area where we are, 0.67 right now. And we'll, you know, show you more detail as it goes on later mm -hmm. on. And this, I'll let David explain, just uh, while the, the guys are moving on, just in basic terms, using your illustra your map there, what are the objectives and uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the operation yeah. spring day? Okay, well, I mean, first of all, I mean, I just want to back up a little bit something you mentioned about, you know, visiting these battlefields. And I think it's important because, you know, I always say, you know, you have to make a pilgrimage, particularly from this side of the Atlantic. You've got to go. And a lot of people tend to forget that, you know, Barrier Ridge in many ways is Canada's Vimy, you know, in World War II. There's three kicks of the can, if you will, to be able to capture it. And it costs a lot of Canadian lives over a series of about three weeks. So if you do get a chance, you know, Juno's not your only stop. You know, there was a lot of Canadian blood, as they said, shed on these beautiful green fields back in 1944. And what we're talking about today is perhaps the bloodiest. Um, and unfortunately, it becomes quite the disaster for the Second Canadian Corps. And um, what you're seeing very quickly is a very complex and complicated plan. One of the reasons one would argue for its downfall. Um, the idea was to go essentially in three, three and a half to four phases. The fourth one was contingent. And actually, you could argue, I suppose, the third one for a while. But the first two, first one was to capture the line that you can see, um, the first line. There you go. And the idea was to capture that at night at 0330. The idea was to push through this line and move up to... Uh, Mesa Orn and to Verrier Village. So that was the idea in phase one with the North Nova Scotias coming down into Tilly Leg Compang, the Royal Highland Regiment of, uh, excuse me, the uh, Royal uh, Highland Light Infantry um, taking Verrier Village and the Calgary Highlanders taking Mesa Orn. Now that was all to be accomplished by 0530, first tank light. Okay? So the idea is do this at night. So you can get your infantry across the fields that we just showed, because let's face it, ridges are never kind to of infantry. So the idea is that you want to use either massive bombardment, like they did on various battles in World War I, to protect your troops, or you want to use the cover of darkness. And that was the idea. They would be able to seize the crest of Verrier Ridge by the time daylight started to poke out from behind the ridge. At that point, phase two was to go ahead. 
And that was with the Black Watch and the Royal Regiment of Canada pushing through, so basically leapfrogging, and capturing Fontenay-le-Marmillon and a place called Roquencourt. Now, this is crucial for the success of the entire plan, because what this does is create a breach in the German line. And the Black Watch on one side and the Royal Regiment of Canada from Toronto on the other are going to form the solid shoulders of that breach to ensure that if the Germans counterattack, they can hold on and defend. While, they've, while they're holding the shoulders of that breach, the 7th Armored Division is going to barrel right down in between, followed by the Guards Armored Division, and they are going to spring out behind the 1st SS. Basically, as I said before, turn the flank, and they are going to grab the Kremsnell Spur, and they are going to imperil the 1st SS. Now, the idea at the time was it will probably provoke the 1st SS to pull back, but if it doesn't, it will provoke a major counterattack to relieve them by the German Panzer Reserves. And that is what Operation Spring is all about. It's about engaging the uh, German reserves and writing them down, as Montgomery would say, in his euphemistic mm. way. And so it's, um, it, it appears to be simple, but the method was extremely complicated. And it was based, and what, one of the arguments I make in the book is it was predicated on a timetable. And timetables in any military operation, if they're strictly adhered to, are a recipe for disaster. Yeah, and and there's a lot of moving parts see. with a lot of units that haven't worked together previously. Um, yeah. The Seventh Armored Division, the British unit, they're not quite hit their stride yet after North Africa. That's a fair <laughs> statement. Um, Guards Armored are fairly new to everything. Um, it's it the second you know division are fairly new to everything it's it's a, a, a very complex operation in fact even just my research putting this show together you realize there's a lot of things that that need to be taken into consider and doing it at night let's let's talk about how rare it is doing anything at night in world war ii in normandy uh, night times are just yeah. intermittent shelling and no movement this is and this is one of simmons yeah. things isn't it his night time is he says, and, and we'll put it on Duncan's image uh, there as, as they're driving. This is this idea of just how open this area is here. Mm -hmm. And they'll be stopping at the lay-by very shortly um, near near points, or just south of point 60, but I'll show you on the Google image where they are. Yeah. And, of course, this is the time of year. It was 76 years ago. We noticed that some of the fields have had the wheat cut. Some have yet to have it cut. So it, we'll, 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 we'll show you a bit of everything as we're going on. But a lot of these advances are going to be men moving through wheat two mm -hmm. foot, three foot high, and that's exactly what we're doing. So they're pulling in this area now, which we chose just to give an idea of a view back to point to Hill, Hill 61, which is not a, a, a it's you know, slightly lower than point 67, 61, 67. They are the heights in meters above sea level. But just to give an idea of where they are, and, I'll, and then we'll do this drive south. So I'll show you the image again that I have prepared and show you those following where they are. So they've mm -hmm. moved from... Point 67 over here, they went into Saint Martin de Fontenay, turned on this road here, and they've now, sorry, this road here, and they've come up now, and they're at this bit area here where we had the lay by, and just to their northwest is the summit, although don't look for a craggy peak, but the kind of the bump that is Hill 61. Yeah. And then I'll hand over to David to explain the significance of where that comes in with regards to the uh, the Black yeah. Watch. So, um, that, 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 that's Duncan's feed there showing the view. And, you know, it's very hard on the quality of images we have coming back from mobile phones to really get an idea of the height differences around here. But yeah. there is there is a bump. A put, so, yeah. which, but that's important. That's important. I mean, a lot of times when we talk about ridges, everybody thinks that you talk about Heartbreak Ridge and this incredible escarpment, you know, or like the cliffs at DF. Yeah. But you re realize that what you're seeing here now is, generally speaking, what the average everyday infantryman is going to see on a regular basis. In so Northwest. that's the view there. Dunk, sorry to interrupt. That's the view there. That's San Martin over to the left there in the valley. And then that, that is that wheat field with the pylons. That is Hill 61. And then point 67 is beyond that. Um, can you Is your Zoom working today, Duncan, or not? The, we have a weird thing where the cameras, sometimes the Zoom function works on it and sometimes it doesn't. I don't know whether it does or doesn't. Um, but yeah, we should be able to see back to point 67 at some point. But this is just an idea of showing this again, this our first real glimpse of the openness of the terrain around here. And so explain what the previous four or five days had been like for the Black sure. Watch and where they'd been. Well, I think, you know, we, even without the Zoom, you can really get a good idea of just how exposed that position is. Yeah, on there's Hill a there in the background. 
Yeah, because essentially where you are would have been where, where the camera is right now is, well, that's pretty much no man's land and the Germans yeah. would have been to the left. And so as a result, that becomes the home for the Black Watch for about four days leading up to Operation Spring. Now, at that time, the wheat, uh, because the Germans had evacuated the area and the wheat had been growing for the longest time but being harvested, it was standing anywhere between three to five feet tall. So a man could literally disappear. And of course, when you are digging into slip trenches, uh, it provides wonderful cover from view, but it provides nothing from shells and artillery, and, mm. you know, artillery shells and mortars and rockets. And so when the um, Black Watch take over the position after the Canadians attempt to take Barrier the first time in Operation Atlantic, um, they're pushed up to Hill 61 when there's a, there's a panic and two of Canadian units break under pressure and they start coming back. And the Black Watch is thrown in to reestablish the line under any circumstances. Well, they end up inheriting this godforsaken piece of real estate and they're told to hold it at all costs. And so when they dig in, they're digging into the wheat. And now they have to sit there for four days under constant German fire, rockets, artillery, um, and mortars, constant, all the time. They haven't had a hot meal since probably the 18th of July. So, you know, for a couple of days to start with, and then they're basically living off their ration packs. Um, the other thing too, because of the panic, that ensued in the previous battle, the brigadier in charge of this sector cut off the rum supply. Not a good thing to do when men are in battle, heavy combat for the first time, oh, if not been properly inoculated. And it's not like today where we have medication that will control our anxiety. Mm. Uh, was your Paxil, your Zoloft or whatever yeah, else, yeah. the thing that steadied the nerves. And now they cut that off. So what we're seeing within the Canadian Army, particularly the 2nd Canadian Division at this time, is a dramatic spike in um, a psychological casualty. In, uh, and it's not just because of the rum, but it's because of you know being exposed to battle for the first time, stressors that are involved with it, the lack of sleep, the lack of proper food, and nothing to you know basically calm the nerves. And on top of all that, you've got to fend off the Germans. The Germans are now probing aggressively they're sending their snipers down in the wheat. They're sending, you know, Panzer-led patrols that are constantly coming in and probing at every single time, at every single moment of the day. And so as a result, you then also have to send out your patrol. Although you're sitting in the position, you're doing anything but sitting. And so this takes a dramatic toll. And you can imagine what it was like for the men of the Black Watch who were under a steady drain of casualties both psychological and physical from all the shelling and all the action that's going on to suddenly like the rest of their brethren in the second Canadian division being thrown in or thrust into the battle on the 25th mm. after sitting in a position like this for five days and nights. And lack of sleep, lack of everything. And the, the, the view mag had there, because we'll have to ask them off to drive South soon that the water tower in the far Back there in the middle there, the water tower is one of our reference points we'll be using later on in the battle for orientation and showing you where you are. Um, and what they're going to do now, because we're trying to kick stick to a timetable, is sort of drive the whole battlefield. Now, there'll be various points where you won't be able to see much of the, as they're driving because there's hedges on the right, but there'll be other bits where you can see. And so they'll film out the window and Dave will carry on setting the, uh, the scene. And we'll particularly go off and talk about the... Um, uh, the Germans. And we, you know, we mm. mentioned it there, David, and the, the, the units we're talking about here, they're they're pretty damn damn good you know this is these are yeah. these are not there these aren't the um the, the guys from the beaches these are the you know the first ss second ss the, these ninth ss tenth ss these people in this area here they're pretty good at what they're doing and um um yeah so um yeah we'll without a doubt i mean you know we the the, uh, the main unit that the second canadian division is facing at this moment is actually the 272nd infantry division. Yeah. And a lot of times, you know, because they're backed up by the 9th SS, the 10th SS, the 1st SS, uh, and the 2nd Panzer Division, which are all, you know, elite Panzer Divisions in the German order of battle, we tend to um, lessen the quality of the 272nd. And we tend to think that it's kind of like you would say, you know, filled with Ostfront soldiers from the, you know, from the beaches, etc. And there was a contingent of Ostfront uh, or Eastern Front soldiers that were impressed into service. But the 272nd was still a damn good infantry. 
Mm. So as a result, I mean, uh, you know, you've got a um, a highly trained Canadian unit, but green going into battle against a bunch of seasoned veterans who have fought on the Eastern Front, in some cases for years, and more importantly, have fought um, intimately in the kind of terrain that the Canadians now find themselves fighting in for the first time. And terrain dictates everything, or almost everything, when it comes to combat. And so as a result, Canadians who are now find themselves in wheat field, just like the Brits, um, haven't been able to train in wheat fields simply because of food rationing in England. You're not allowed to go in and trample the crops. So they've had no exposure to this kind of terrain. And so it's kind of like being, maybe not as bad, but you know, it's akin to being thrown into a jungle for the first time. You know, there's a whole bunch of different things. You know, command and control is different when you can't, you know, difficult when you can't see, you know, your platoon commander. Because, you know, you, if you expose yourself over the week, you're going to get your head taken off. So then everything becomes verbal, and that's hard to hear when you have shells exploding. We're starting to see mags should be coming out the hedgerows fairly shortly, and we should be able to see across. So this this view mag is looking at. Well, Dun we'll put on Duncan for a second. Duncan is basically going straight due south, and now it should. It looks like we're, we're yeah there we are, and there's mags view uh, back to the, the to the to the west there. So you can see this is where we're going to be exploring in detail later on. So you can get an idea of that. The drive we're doing is we're only going two or three miles uh, south of fontenay le and then we're going to stop at a position um, and give you the German perspective, the German layout. But you can see yourselves now watching just how exposed and open that mm -hmm. position is. And I don't want to end up repeating myself. But I do do that quite often because that is the kit. The thing is, it is an open exposed. There's nothing. That is the thing to get across. That is the yeah. visual nature of what we're looking at today. So, Western um, Front. You know, Western yeah. Front, World War One. It's the Somme. It's the Pas it's Passchendaele. You know, it's the same kind of terrain. And by the way, when we have the cameras going through the towns uh, later on, San Martin, Mesa, Orn, and very shortly Fontenay, Le Marmion, um, you'll see watching just how much rebuilding has been done. Yes, they've also expanded these villages because this is absolute prime commuter belt for the city of Caen but even so mm -hmm. the middle of the villages took an absolute pasting over these few weeks and yeah. so lots and lots of rebuilding we will of course show you some bullet holes later on we always try and show you some bullet holes um, we're not quite in the old part of the village yet this is an ex the expanded modern part of it but as you drive down you'll start to see lots of replaced building because that was the nature of what we're looking at and then we're going to stop at a position I'll show you where we're going to go to those watching we're heading off to a position right down they're coming through fontenay le marmion right now they're coming down here and they're going to stop at here where it says tumulus which is an old prehistoric mm. medieval kind of yeah position we're actually not going to that we're going there's conveniently they're doing a road work road works along and there's a lovely 10 foot pile bank of earth there which is perfect for dungan to stand on to do the views around and show it so we don't actually have to go into tomulus and there's a brick building there that when duncan starts walking through the battlefield later on he will refer back to to give you orientation and dave will explain what you know the, the significance of this area is here from in terms of the germans and, and objectives yeah. and aliens um i'll see if they're there yet um then, well while they're doing it why don't we just talk a little bit about the context of the yeah, time sure. because you know, you did mention it. You mentioned it, and I think quite appropriately, that things did not go necessarily according to Montgomery's plan up to this point. As a matter of fact, the area that we're talking about today should have been in Allied hands, according to Montgomery's very loose schedule, uh, by somewhere around D plus 2, D plus 3. And certainly, by D plus 17, he had promised to be in Falaise. Now, of course, Falaise was still a long way away. And this ended up coming back to haunt Montgomery because what they were going to use the plains south of Varia Ridge for was for advanced fighter bases, or at least yeah, tactical yeah. air power bases. And of course, if you know something about the politics that's you know, unfolding up above, Montgomery's under a lot of pressure. There's a lot of people within Chafe and even the British High Command within Chafe who don't like him and want to get rid of him. And so the air barons are using this perceived lack of success as you know, one of their uh, bullets in their gun to try to get rid of him. So there's intense pressure on him to deliver to make sure he can keep the air barons at bay. The other problem too is, remember the clock's ticking. There's a lot of war weariness in England. You're in a stalemate position in Normandy. Um, the Russians are going gangbusters on the Eastern Front. I mean, they're stealing headlines around the world. They're advancing 10 miles, 20 miles, 100 miles in a day, and they're getting all the headlines 
Meanwhile, back in Normandy, we've moved the goalposts five inches. It's not looking good. And one of the reasons it's not looking good, oh, by the way, you also have V1 bombs that are now, of course, you know, they're falling bombs down. are coming yeah. down on England. But one thing that I think a lot of people have tended to forget was that a lot of pressure being put on Montgomery by Eisenhower was actually coming from Washington in the sense that President Roosevelt had just announced he was going to run for an unprecedented fourth term. So the last thing you really want to be doing is fighting a war when you have to worry about, you know, an election campaign that's going on behind that may be poking its head down yeah. and putting pressure on you to succeed. In other words, break out in Normandy need something that is happening so it's amazing when we talk about operation spring which kind of in many cases gets lost in the historiography because it really shouldn't because there, it becomes a lightning rod for all these things that are happening at this time so it's really amazing to see how you can go literally from the highest offices all the way right down to the poor you know the poor kid um who's in the slit trench right at the front lines well, it's interesting that um, uh, I, I just checked James Holland's Normandy book last night to, to check what it said about Verrier Ridge, and it really doesn't get a mention because in a single volume book that he focuses on Cobra, which is completely justified. That's fine. You know, there's lots of things going on. And that is the nature of the Battle of Normandy. If you if you talk about one thing a lot, you have to omit something else a lot. That is just... Well, exactly. You know, um, we yeah. have the Canadian historians like Mark Zelke and other guys who've done a lot of, a lot of writing about it. So there's... Anyway, there's Duncan's view of from this pile of earth that there are people collecting earth from it for some reason, for sandbag or something. But that, when Duncan's camera and image sort of settles in there because of the bandwidth, that that is the tumulus, is that little feature directly ahead of us there, and that brick house is is the house. And apparently, according to David, there's like a little private museum about this. This there is feature. Yeah, we I stumbled on it many years ago, about 15 years ago, when I was filming uh, Black Watch Massacre for History Television here in Canada. We went over and we knocked on the door to find out if we could, you know, film on the land. And the woman who opened it said, oh, you must be here to see the museum. And of course, in my very narrow view at the time, I thought, oh, my God, they've got a museum to Battle of Area Ridge. How wonderful. And uh, yeah, to my uh, amazement, no, it was a museum about the tumulus, which is about 250,000 years old. Yeah. It's, and it's um, one of the greatest archaeological uh, areas of France, apparently. And I didn't know that at the time. So... You know, this is why I would say as a, a military historian, when you're running around battlefields, you can very much be an accidental tourist without yeah. a day, you know, and that's it. But I mean, there what you're getting... Background, sorry to interrupt you, yeah. is, is the water no. tower that we could see earlier on. So we're now south of that. Yeah. We were north of it. And now we're now... We're now at the, on, well, I'll let David carry on, but we're now at the German position kind of looking north. So this, yeah. it'll be yeah. through these fields towards us and that little copse of trees we'll be able to see later on because yeah. that will be seen later. So this is the, That's uh, the advance is coming towards yeah. us. So David, yes. in this exact area, and if there's any of your PowerPoint images you want me to show, just tell me which one you want. But what what is here waiting and where? how are they deployed, the Germans? We know all about the hull yeah. down what have you, what, what have they got here waiting for the poor Canadians? You're right. A lot of times when we talk about ridges, we tend to think uh, because of Hollywood movies that everybody's lined up on the top of the ridge yeah. and yeah. just shooting down. But that's not where ridges come in. What you want to do is you want to be on what they call the reverse slope behind because you maintain your concealment. Nobody knows uh, what you really have in store until they come across and they silhouette themselves. And of course, uh, if we can go back to the original shot, which is actually what would have been the German point of view on that particular day as the Canadians made their attack. There we as are. soon as the Black Watch, there you go, that's perfect. As soon as the Black Watch would press that ridge, you can see with the skyline behind what kind of targets they would become. Now, you can imagine for an infantryman, try being in the tanks of the first Hussars who would then have to crest that ridge as well. You're beautifully lit up for every German tank and anti-tank gun in the area. So that becomes the most dangerous moment of any attack uphill on a ridge or a feature like this, is that moment where you need to crest the ridge. Yeah, That's yeah. when you're at your most exposed. And then you go into the ultimate dogfight, that close quarter combat in the German main line, which is essentially where the camera is right now. And that would be the real scrappy moment. And of course, I believe Fontenay de la Marmion is to the right of yep, the exactly. camera. And that was the Black Watch final objective. So 
So the idea was to grab that, dig in, consolidate quickly. You needed to set up your anti-tank guns as quick as possible, bring up your mortars, register the artillery, and call in air power, because you know it's part of German doctrine. They are going to respond, and they're going to respond in a heavy, nasty way. So that's it really is a, a race against time. There are so many different factors that come into this simply than saying the battalion moved up the hill. That's, you know, that's a very simple way of putting it. Um, all these parts, you mentioned it earlier, all these moving parts uh, have to come together. And I suppose, you know, in the old military maxim of keeping it simple, stupid, um, you would hope would apply because the more moving parts you bring in, the more contingencies you need. And the more, and the more things that can go wrong. Yeah, Exactly. And then yeah. you always need to ask yourself, what if? What if this goes wrong? What if this doesn't work? What if this doesn't work? You always need, as they say uh, now, your branches and your sequels. Yeah, you know, you yeah. always have to be prepared. That seemed to have been lacking within um, uh, Operation Spring and particularly Simmons' makeup. He, um, I guess you could argue, and I certainly argue, there's an unhealthy level of arrogance here. You want your confident, you know, you want your commander to be confident, no doubt about it, even cocky. But there's that fine line when they cross that suddenly their plan is a work of art, that suddenly their plan must be adhered to at all costs because it will win the day regardless of what the enemy is doing. That becomes deadly. And that's one of the reasons why Operation Spring goes off the rails, goes off the rails very quickly, and at the end becomes so costly for the Canadians and the Brits who are taking part. I'm just going to reference the fact that watching today, Alex Black is watching, Sheldrake Six. So these are people who know their their Canadian mm. history. And, you know, Operation Spring is one of those operations, kind of like the British Goodwood, I suppose, the Canadian Goodwood, where every historian's got a slightly different view of it, of blame and whose blame is this. And, you know, you could just do it. We could do a two-hour panel with a group of historians and just thrash out all the mm. various shortcomings and the various pitfalls and short you know, today is David's day. And, you know, Alex, I'd love to have you come on, do something in the future. And, uh, and Max is just giving a shot there. I said a little bit of wheat there, but just an idea. This is the image that these black watch guys have been facing for a, about a week before um, this operation. I'm just dug in in these foxholes there. And we'll have the guys move on. And we, with the camera team will start splitting up soon. We're going to drop Duncan in the middle of the, cam in, of the battlefield. And he, as usual, Duncan likes to be the one to cover the distance. And we'll split Duncan and Colin and Mag up because Colin, we haven't used his feed yet because he's driving at the moment. We'll bring his feed in later on. So there we are. That that position there, that that tumulus, the the, red, brid, the brick building there, Fontenay Le Marmion. We'll be referencing that later on when we're out in the fields there. But um, we're going to press on fairly shortly, guys. So that's fantastic camera again. I'm really thrilled yeah, with what we're doing today. The weather is holding so far. 45 minutes in. Um, so I'm happy. If you're happy, I'm happy. Um, so that's Duncan's final image there of the battlefield, but well, from this location. And then we'll move on and we'll tell you what we're doing next. So what's going to happen next, those watching, is I'll bring up that Google Earth image again, um, is they're driving up into Mesa Orn and Colin is going to drop Duncan here. And then Duncan is going to make his way kind of the, the opposite direction to the Canadians went, but this is the how the logistically we had to work this show out. It was quite a lot mm. of things. We had a lot of mo uh, spare moving parts to coordinate as well and where we can have cameras at different points. And so Duncan's going to kind of be in these fields here. Colin's going to carry away. He's going to drop Mag off, uh, Mag off here at near the forming up point later on. And Colin's going to drive up down here and he's going to give us a view from this area here. So we're going to have at some point three cameras giving you the Perfect. view, one from here, one from here, one from here. Then we'll all be finishing in the San Martin area where it all gets very exciting later on. But I'm just giving you an idea of watching where we're going with this and what we're doing so that, you know, you can, you follow us with your orientation. So I think they're heading off now. Um, they are. And I'll say it again. Notice how open it is and you get inside the buildings. And I'll let I'll let David talk. But I'll, when we're in the, in the villages, look again for yourself at the uh, the, um, the the repaired buildings and the modern the modern nature of these villages. Yeah. These are, these were almost wiped off the map. Some of these villages. Um, we, we we know about the big cities like Saint Lo and La Havre and Caen, but we forget that the destruction of, of Normandy goes to these little villages as well that that, that, that had yeah. lots of people. And every single one, of course, we always say this has a monument, and there'll be the First World War dead, and there'll be the Second World War dead. And this in this case, it's from the from the bombing. Uh, every village yeah. would have lost, you know, a few people. So um, this is obviously a modern modern housing development. So um, 
we're getting to the point where we can start talking about the uh, the first phase that that and where everything starts begins to go wrong, really, David, isn't it? So yeah. let's let's start with um uh the the that that first phase of the of the northern villages there, the the yeah. uh, the Saint Andre bit, and the, I'll let you hand I'll hand over to you, and I'll sure. I'll let you. Well, I it. think. I think what you brought up is very important. Um, these villages were, you know, typical Norman construction, right? Stone houses. And uh, so as a result, the Germans were able to work these in in an interlocking fashion. So each one essentially became a, a fortress, if you will. And it became um, what the Germans would refer to as a hedgehog. So in other words, they would be prickly with anything and everything, anti-tank guns, machine guns, et cetera. And then they would be connected or interconnected with lines of trenches, et cetera. Not necessarily in World War I style, but um, they would have areas, you know, fire areas. And the idea was really to trade firepower for manpower. They were trying to conserve as much manpower as possible. So in their defensive doctrine, they would let their automatic weapons, their mortars, et cetera, their firepower do the talking. Now, when the Canadian Corps arrives in this area, uh, late on the 19th into the early day of the 20th, um, Simmons decides he's going to plaster the town that actually the camera is in right now, the twin towns, as we call them, St. Andre and St. Martin. They're actually side yeah, by side yeah. um, on the main road that leads to Thury Harcourt. And he calls in what is called a murder party, which basically means you're taking every gun in the court. If I'm not mistaken, it may even include uh, the army, the second army. And you're pulverizing these two towns for 15 straight minutes of shelling basically a hurricane bombardment. And then out of that comes the um, Cameron Highlanders of Canada, and they're told to get in and secure St. Martin so that when Operation Spring starts, there's going to be a smooth or a secure start line for everybody to go. And again, like a lot of things that fall through the cracks in, um, in the spring historiography, we tend to forget the Cameron Highlands of, uh, Highlanders of Canada fight one of the most incredible like mini Stalingrad kind of battles in Normandy for the four days leading up to spring against the Germans who were in this town. And it's constant. You read the message logs and you go through the intelligence reports, you will see that there's a constant ebb and flow in this town and it's never really secured. The other thing that's happened is because of the bombardments, like you get right across in every one of these towns, um, everything is pre collapsed. So, you know, if you're in a house that's pristine and you fortify it and the house gets hit, not only are you at risk of getting hit by the artillery itself, the explosion and the shrapnel and whatever else, but the collateral damage of the house collapsing on you. But when those houses are already collapsed, you can then burrow in rather safely into those areas, reinforce them, and they can withstand a heavier punishment. So even when the Canadians are advancing into these towns that have been, quote, pulverized, the actual fact is it's kind of the reverse, that they have actually been reinforced in some cases by the fact of the rubbling in advance. Yeah. So when the Camerons get involved, they're having a difficult time just moving from house to house, let alone street to street, and sometimes even room to room. But um, by the time spring kicks off at 3.30 in the morning, Everybody, or at least maybe not the guys in the front lines, but certainly high command, brigade, division, and of course, corps, um, have it in their minds that this is a perfectly secured location, that there shouldn't be a problem with moving through, and it's anything but. So at 0330, all the guns start in support, and the first wave starts to move. And in the area that we're in, it's the Calgary Highlanders, a fantastic regiment from the Western part of Canada, who then move off Hill 67, where we were at the beginning of this. And they try to get through, basically go straight up Verrier. And unfortunately, it's nighttime, it's dark. Um, there's problems with navigation. The Germans open up on them. There's uh, you know, Germans in the town of St. Martin, which was supposed to be secured, and it wasn't. They opened fire on the flanks of the Calgarys. The Calgarys have a nightmare. A lot of times we, you know, we center on the Black Watch and the fact that they were indeed massacred and justifiably so. But you tend to forget all the other units, and particularly the Calgary Islanders, took massive casualties as well. But all said and done, they failed to get uh, firmly into Maser Orn. 
And one of their companies even got lost and doubled back and ended up back in St. Martin meeting the Black Watch as it came up. So basically what happens is Saint Mar the town of St. Martin itself um, is basically a hornet's nest of activity when it shouldn't be at 0330 in the morning. And this throws off the timing for Operation Spring. Simmons has been given until noon and only noon to be successful. And if he's not, Dempsey's going to shut him down and shut the operation down because he understands the formidable nature now of what is facing the Canadians on the other side. Just over the last few days, they've been, you know, watching as the Germans, mostly through ultra signals intelligence and other types of intelligence, uh, they've been assessing that the Germans are amassing anywhere between a conservative estimate of about 130 tanks, assault guns, uh, and maybe 400. So you can imagine that that is a major battle. And so as a result, given that this is not a major breakthrough, but a softening up operation, it appears that Dempsey does not necessarily want to risk everything. That's not necessarily translated to Simmons. Simmons is pushing to be as successful as humanly possible by the time the plug is pulled on him. So when the plan starts to go off the rails at 0330 in the morning, Instead of attempting to assess the situation and figure out the, what is happening, in other words, situational awareness and adjust his plan accordingly, he's starting to force his plan even more. He's kind of doubling down, if you will. In other words, I'm losing at the craps table, but I just know if I can roll one more, I'm going to be able to do this. And this becomes, I would argue, this is where the train goes off the tracks. This is where mm. Operation Spring comes unhinged. And you can argue that basically the fate of the men on the ground is essentially sealed because Simmons does not have um, the kind of fingertip feel, as the Germans would call it, to be able to understand what is happening when his beautiful plan is not unfolding as he So that's where, believe it or not, that's where we find ourselves at 0330 in the morning when the Black Watch of Canada finally kick in and they are supposed to be moving down through St. Martin to get to their form up point, which is just south of the town, and then to launch their assault on fontenay le marmion at first light at 0530. So there's a lot going on at this point. So I'm, I'm just going to say, you, Alex Black is uh, giving you lots of compliments in the YouTube comments about your, your work in this, about Dempsey as being uh, game-changing in this area. So let's look at what Duncan is looking at now. So Duncan, I'll remind you again where Duncan is. Duncan is here. So this is right in the middle of the battlefield. So David's been talking oh, yeah. about, so fontenay le marmion is down here to the south, Mesa on over here, and then up to the top is Saint-Martin or Saint-Martin de Fontenay. So Duncan is right in the middle of where everything happens, and he can show back to the German position, the tumulus stand back north where he's going to end up, and Colin will be at his position, and Mag will be at the forming up point fairly soon, and then we can kind of get to grips with this battle and really try and get across the, the nature of the terrain and the decisions, and yeah. um, because we're, you know, we're, we're, we've got a lot to cover still, and we're, we're already 52 minutes in. Oh. Uh, which is fine. But um, so that's where Duncan is. So um, Duncan, sh can you show us the, well, that, there's that wood we could see early on. You're looking north now, aren't you, Duncan, roughly? Um, and yeah, that's north. And then behind you, you should be able to see that building, the tumulus again, where we were earlier on and show us the German positions. Yeah. 180. Yeah, around, right yeah. around. That's the crest of area. That's the crest of the ridge there. And that's the reverse slope of the German positions. Yeah, exactly. So that's really good imagery here. And Mag is now out. I think you're out now, Mag. Yep, you're there. You're, so that is now, I'll show you where Mag is. It's all going well, fairly smoothly so far. So Mag is over here. So Mag is quite some way north of, of Duncan. And she, she is just in the village of San Martin, which David just explained. The Calgary Highlanders had a huge problem taking that out and we're still fighting there and uh th that's another su another subject we could we could spend mm. more time on but we we, we can't because we're going to focus on the black watch so we now uh colin will be up so colin is going to be up here fairly soon then we'll have our three camera teams in place and we can really get to grips with this so um if you want me to show any of your images from your powerpoint tell me which ones you want me to show uh, david and i'll do that but that is the battlefield there um 
and yeah, maybe um, maybe you can go to the aerial photo of the day to show because remember what you're you're showing right now is fantastic because it shows just how exposed this yeah. terrain is, and that's one well, of the reasons reports that they wanted to go at night. Yeah, that's actually an aerial photo. Yeah, there we go, perfect. And you can see there on the map now that was shot just after the battle in uh, I guess it would have been late July, I think, of yeah. late July, early August. So you can see the heavy battle damage. And you can see up at the top, you can see uh, the Twin Towns. Oh, actually, St. Andre is a little bit further north. That's yeah. actually St. Martin. St. Martin there, isn't it? That's St. Martin. And Maggie's, oh, about, Maggie's about where, just between the uh, forming up point and the church. So Maggie's about here, and there's new houses around here now. Yeah. Uh, Duncan is over here somewhere, and Colin will be over here somewhere. So we'll have the three Perfect. people right in the middle of this battle over here, and uh, we can explain it to you. And so that's where we are. That's what we're yeah. looking at. One of the big reference points also in the battle is what you see in the middle. You got it. The factory. The factory what yeah. They called the factory. In reality, it was a mine head, but it looked like a factory. And all the soldiers called it the factory. And um, contrary to what we may have been told in other history books many years ago, um, the Germans were not using the mine shafts that ran under Verrier because there was a lot of mining in the area um, to infiltrate troops from behind Verrier through Verrier and then up into St. Martin. What they were doing was they were using the mine shafts to hide in when the artillery would come in. They would take refuge in the mine shafts and they would reappear from the mine shafts and then they would infiltrate into St. Martin. So it became a waypoint really for both sides during the battle because it was readily visible and you could see it from everywhere and you could use it to navigate. Uh, very difficult to do that at night, of course. Um, but at the same time. Now, the other thing, too, is, you know, what the viewer really needs to understand here is just how exposed this is. You know, when you're advancing, if you're the Canadians, and you have to advance up very air. You're advancing into a horseshoe of German fire, essentially. Yeah. You have Germans to the left, Germans ahead of you, and Germans to the right across the Orne River. Not only do they have forward observation posts that are able to call in artillery and mortar and rockets, but they also have the support of Tiger Tank from, you know, the SS Heavy uh, Panzer Battalion. Plus they have, and a lot of people always talk about the 88. And basically, yes, the 88 is incredibly effective, but so are the 76 and the 75 millimeter anti-tank guns and tank guns, which of course are equally deadly. And of course the allies simply refer to everything that comes whizzing by as an 88. But they are also littering the area. So you were talking about one of the most formidable defensive locations in all of Normandy since perhaps they've hit the beach. And so this is what the, um, the Canadians and the Black Watch are facing as they end up working up the ridge. So it's an absolute nightmare. And by the time you have broad daylight, you, you know, you've got nothing to shield you except maybe a smoke screen. And you better hope to hell that your artillery comes down on time and on target. So um, there's that mag is showing south, that same wood that uh, Duncan can show from um, south of. So that, that's kind of the reference point. That's halfway between their two positions. So Duncan, yeah. if you can show us that wood again, that's, that's kind of north of you. There we are. It's very distinctive. So that's, that's Duncan's view from the south of it. And there we have mag's view from the north of it. And that's so, so yeah. Duncan is going to be making his way north to kind of eventually join up with Mag and, Co and Colin, where they are. So, um, yeah, this is all cool stuff. One for you, Paul. Directly Sorry, in, yeah, just directly in front of me, you'll see one of the mine shafts directly in front that uh, you were just talking about. Do you see it Fantastic. in there? That's one of the colliery mine shafts directly in front of me. And what, while you're talking, while you're on, online, Duncan, it's not too windy. You know, you're a former guardsman. You know, you've done, this is your, you did two reckeys up this area in the last week and you're now here. Um, it, it, how does it feel standing in the middle of nowhere like that? There is nowhere to hide. There is literally nowhere to hide. This is so barren and so open here. It's unbelievable. You know, they've got two, two and a half feet of corn to play with and that's it. That is all they've got is cover here. Yeah. Yeah. There's no doubt you have to reach your objective and you're going to die. 
There's no doubt. I mean, and, and from the German perspective, looking back, where I am now is where they silhouetted. Yeah. So yeah. exactly where I am, they would have just been, the Germans would have just picked them off. They would have worked out their formation, coming across the high ground and just taken them out. These poor yeah. guys didn't stand a chance down here. They really didn't. And I'm pretty sure, knowing the Germans, they would have been zeroed in on this, on this piece of high ground. Oh and yeah, they take... they've been there for plenty of time to get everything zeroed in, and and of course the tanks and the SB, SBGs have plenty of range, and so it's brilliant stuff. So um, we ought to start talking about the battle. So Mag is at the forming up point. So I'll put Mag's view on again, and then Mag's gonna make her way into San Martin. So tell us about the the, the Black Watch filtering into position on the more on the on that morning yeah. at about five thirty. Well, as I mentioned before, I mean, first of all, we, you know, you need to know a little bit about the Black Watch to understand what's happening. I mean, the Black Watch um, are Canada's most storied regiment. Certainly in World War II, they were. Um, they come out of the trenches in World War I. Most of them are, you know, Scottish heritage uh, who have emigrated to Canada over the years. Um, you have, you know, the officers are from the Scottish economic elite in Montreal, you know, the men who helped build Canada, if you will. Uh, and the men in the ranks are from all over the place, mostly Montreal, mostly the working class Anglophone areas. Um, but you do have a smattering of Brits uh, and Scotsmen who have joined them over the years and Eastern Europeans, believe it or not, who have either immigrated to Canada or made their way across. And what's fascinating, also about, I'd say about five to 10 percent were Americans, which is interesting. Americans wow. who had come up to join the Canadian Army before the United States was in the war. And because the Black Watch had such a famous reputation coming out of World War I, it became a natural draw. And part of that reputation was based on some of the heaviest combat in World War I. Um, that and the fact that they were the only regiment in Canada to raise three battalions and put them in the field. They ended up garnering the most uh, battle honors, individual awards, six Victoria Crosses. So when they came out of the trenches of World War I, they were the sports superstars, if you will. They were the man you. Sorry, I know I'm a Gunners fan, but I have to say that. Um, and, uh, you know, they were the New York Yankees, the Montreal Canadiens, whatever you will. But the key was they knew it. There was definitely a Black Watch attitude and a Black Watch, you know, swagger. And they had become, you know, very important and influential within the Canadian Army. But when they finally arrived in England in 1940, they're dying to get in combat. There's a tremendous amount of pressure because it's the sons and the nephew of the men who were in World War I who are now expecting the Black Watch to take that torch and carry it just as high. So when the Black Watch arrive on July 6th, the month after D-Day, they end up spending about 12 days in inoculation right at the Abbey Garden. So mm -hmm. they're under, you know, getting used to what it's like in front, you know, in a frontline position. Then they go into an attack on the 18th during Operation Atlantic, which is the subsidiary of Woodwood. They mess up, uh, to be honest, they mess up their Orn crossing and uh, they lose a company of men. Then they're thrust into Hill 61, which we talked about before. And so they've been exposed to continual combat now for seven days or six and a half days going into this. Um, and finally, at 3.30 in the morning, what's left of them, which are roughly just about 350 men um, are now move out of their positions on Hill 61 and they start a long march in snake formation. So basically all the companies, the four rifle companies are lined out in single file and they're working their way in through, they're going to just skirt St. Martin and you could probably show that. I'm not sure if you've got that uh, shot again from the PowerPoint, the one of the aerial shots with all the arrows. And if you go back, you can actually see their route that we have. Uh, go back up. I think it's the previous one. It's the one with all the arrows where they're coming down Hill 61 and through St. Martin. There it is. Perfect. You got it. Excellent. Wait, go back. <laughs> this is how I teach, by the way. Right. So... Yeah, it's, it's the one we saw there before with all the arrows. So they start sna snaking their way down at, you know, at 3.30 in the morning, um, fully expecting, as they've been told, that everything has gone according to plan. But of course, you know, they're pretty sure it's going to happen. And as they arrive to skirt past St. Martin, 
they basically run into a hornet's nest. Um, they stumble across a German forward observation position, which immediately calls in mortar fire, um, which then forces the Black Watch under Colonel uh, Cantley, Stephen Cantley, who was a fantastic officer, number one, you know, graduated top in his class from RMC, um, to make a quick decision. And the quick decision is to move into St. Martin, thinking it's secured. What he does is he ends up moving into a St. Martin that not only has the Cameron Highlander still fighting against part of the 272nd Infantry Division, I think it's one of their Fusilier battalions, um, but also part of the Calgary Highlanders, who now are, have made this giant loop and come back. So you can imagine, it truly is a hornet's nest when you've got three Canadian or two and a half Canadian battalions all converging on one spot in the middle of the night with the Germans running around in the middle. All hell is breaking. And they're forced now to fight literally from hedgerow to hedgerow in the town, from house to house in the town, trying desperately to make it to their form up point by 0530. And it's impossible, actually before 0530, because they have to shake out and then they have to go up. And they can't do it. And you can see it in the message log. They're sending message after message. And basically they're moving maybe 100 yards every 15 minutes, which is, given the, you know, what's happening, probably a pretty good clip, but nowhere near sufficient. So as a result, they are behind time. And so when they arrive at the churchyard in St. Martin, um, Cantley and his officers go on a, a quick little recce to find out what's happening. And there's some conflictual evidence about what happens, but either way, he's killed. And his what he would consider his battle adjutant, one of the company commanders, a, a major by the name of Lutzfeld, he's severely wounded, either by machine guns or mortars or a combination of both. Either way, they're both knocked out. And then there is a huge problem because nobody is really sure in the given condition or the current condition with the Black Watch so spread out and still fighting and in danger of dispersal, who actually has battalion command? And the two officers on the scene were actually officers who were just captains days before and have been promoted by the casualties because of the casualties that were taken on Bill 61. Um, they are promoted to acting majors, and they're the senior ranking officers, if you will. But in reality, they're not. They're captains. They're two captains, and the adjutant is there, who's also a captain. And so as a result, you can imagine what it was like. You know, we talk about the fog of war. This is the friction of war. In other words, personalities, lack of sleep, adrenaline pumping, everything else, you know, old scores that need to be settled, all come to a head. And there's a fight between these surviving captains uh, as to who has command. And as a result, there's about 45 minutes of pure paralysis in the Black Watch. while literally orders and counter orders are being given. And they're telling their companies to do one thing and the other one is telling them not to and then telling them not. And it's horrible. Finally, um, Major Phil Griffin, who actually technically is the highest ranking member left, um, makes it onto the scene and arrives at the church. Now, when he does, he's been behind. He was a trailing company. He finds this very prickly situation. And it's not as easy as simply pulling rank at first because he's known these guys forever. And one of the guys, Taylor, John Taylor, who is buying for the, um, for the crown, if you will, or control of the battalion, and who temporarily succeeds because he pulls out his paybook and they're able, believe it or not, comparing pay books, uh, they're able to establish who has temporary command until Griffin shows up. They have a very difficult relationship. A uh, Taylor, who is much older than Griffin, Griffin's only about 25, 26, and Taylor's in his 30s. Taylor actually served under Griffin for a while, and they did not get along at all. And so as a result, there was a bit of another set to that happens with Griffin and with Taylor, and then finally, hey, uh, Griffin pulls rank. And when I say pulls rank, it's not necessarily as absolute. In other words, I'm the major and I'm doing this. There's still a lot of begrudging um, you know, cooperation where the other two captains are acting kind of like um, a, a checks and balances body, if you will. In other words, yeah, Phil, you can call the shots, but we're not necessarily giving you full control unless we believe that everything is fine. 
So basically what you're getting is in some cases almost a command by consensus. And it's very, very difficult because now when Griffin takes over, he's got a horrible situation. You know, first of all, they've missed their timing dramatically. It's no longer dark. They're not going to make the assault up Barrier Ridge in the pre-dawn light, you know, just as it's getting light. Now they're forced to go in broad daylight. And of course, they don't want to do this. They're looking around going, okay, everything's off the rails. We don't necessarily need to do this. And let's inform Brigade. And sure enough, when they inform Brigade, unfortunately, it's not a push-pull kind of relationship. Brigadier William McGill, um, by most descriptions, he's considered to be nothing more than a funnel from orders from high command. He, he cracks the whip. You know, it's not about thinking things out. It's about making sure the job gets done. Every time they send a message back and explain their situation, all they're told is, press on, speed is essential, keep going. And so that's the situation they find themselves in. They realize that things have gone off, you know, off the rails what degree they're not necessarily sure but they're not necessarily happy about continuing but they will be dutiful if necessary but that's going to require a direct order so i'm going to and leap in a bit here david the simple yeah. reason is where i'm sitting in Bayer, it is now absolutely chucking it down and the weather normally moves uh, across so it's, there's a potential that in about 15 20 minutes they're going to be um, absolutely um under a torrent of rain so um okay. in order to kind of consider the the duncan and colin standing out in the middle of nowhere we we we'll need to move to the um uh to the actual main the main thrust now. Um, it's all been absolutely fascinating stuff. I'm just it's absolutely chucking it down here. Um, so we'll see. But um, Colin is now um, I'll put on Colin's. Uh, well, it's Colin's view right now. So just to show the image again, where we are, Colin is is here. So he's just south um, and and east of the forming up position. And they've had this terrible torrid time with fighting through San Martin and the buildings yeah. and this command issue that they explaining about brilliantly now. But it's time to get to this 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 the main assault for the uh, for the for Fontenay because um, I'm worried about the weather simply. <laughs> so um, <laughs> yeah. Duncan has been waking his way north. So Duncan is around here somewhere now. Mag has moved up into the village of San Martin and we can show some of the buildings around there shortly but we need to move to the main assault now simply because um i'm a bit worried about the the rain coming yeah fair enough yeah so you know as i mentioned before griffin's got this dilemma although perhaps it's not really his dilemma but everything has gone off the rails and the fascinating part is if you take a look at the historical accounts it appears he's doing the job of the brigadier he's the one making the you know arrangements with the artillery to retime their artillery shoot because they missed their artillery timing He's linking up with the armor, the first Tassars who are going to support them on the attack. He's sending out reconnaissance patrols, fighting patrols. The Brigadier is nowhere to be seen, for whatever reason. And so as a result, he takes a lot on his shoulders that I would argue is way above his ceiling, or not maybe his ceiling, but his pay grade. And so as a result, they have to clear the rest of St. Martin, which they do, and they move down to the crossroads. But now they have to get to their form-up point, which is just next to another sticky location, which is the factory that we mentioned. So they have to go in and they have to clear the factory and they do this. They clear St. Martin, they work down the road, and then they go in and they clear the factory. There, that is actually St. Martin. That is the churchyard. And there's the factory right there. So they have to fight. Uh, I won't say all the damage that you see is due to the Black Watch not at all because a lot of the fighting went on yeah, not only in August, wasn't it? After. Well, yeah. yeah, but you can see the kind of structure that they had to go through. And a lot of the Germans were up in the pylons, in the, uh, in the power pylons. And so there are accounts of literally the Bren gunners advancing at the forefront of the companies, firing from the hip, suppressing the Germans that are up there so they can get in and close to kill them. And so they do. They are, it's, it's an incredible action what they've done. Clear St. Martin, work down to the factory, push through the factory, and now they come to their form-up point. And of course, a lot of people are trying to figure out why the form-up point is there. But if, you know, if you're on the ground, you will understand that although Verrier Ridge is completely exposed into that German horseshoe that I told you about earlier, that one little form-up point, generally speaking, is dead ground. And it can't be seen essentially from anywhere until whatever is in that area starts working up. So basically where that camera is right now, you are not going to be seen by the Germans. 
that's about the only place that you have a chance to hide at that moment. So it makes it, in theory, the perfect area to shake out your battalions, area yeah. your battalion into a box formation. Two companies will advance and then two behind. And then you will have Griffin in the middle with his command jeep, et cetera. And they are going to move up. The idea being they're going to go up over Verrier. There's going to be that exposure right at the crest. And then they are going to descend into Fontenay. Once they have captured Fontenay, the support company with the mortars, the anti-tanks, uh, tank guns, etc., and the carriers are all going to rush forward to help consolidate the position, knowing full well the Germans are going to counterattack. So that's the situation now that the Black Watch find themselves in, uh, probably about 9.30 in the morning. And by that time, they were supposed to be um, safely dug in in Fontenay, but they're now hours behind time. Now, the other thing that, that's weighing on them is the instructions, the instructions from Guy Simmons, that if anything gets delayed, you are to go wide and keep going. And that is now what explains what apparently seems to be, uh, for many years, a bizarre decision by Phil Griffin, which instead of going up towards Maser Orn and skirting Maser Orn, as was called for in the original plan, he's going to go straight up and over Verrier on the shortest distance to his objective. But that was preordained in the planning. And so, yeah, you can see there that originally, with the uh, Calgary Highlanders, in Maser Orn, the first Hazar's tanks were going to come through. The Black Watch were going to advance and just skirt Maser Orn, cross the crest, which was their start line, and then follow an intense artillery barrage laid down by um, the 5th Field Regiment. And they were going to follow the rolling barrage, or actually really it's a, a series of concentrations that are going to lift, uh, giving it a rolling effect, I suppose. And they are going to then hit Fontenay. Now, the difference is that instead of taking kind of like a dog leg approach where you come down a little bit and then turn, Griffin decides they're going to go straight over. So straight up and over Verrier without skirting Mace or Orr. Um, without being on the ground and walking it, it seems very strange to do something like this. But with Mace or Orr not in Canadian hands, and he's really not sure if the Germans are there, he does send a patrol in, but it's kind of inconclusive. Um, he seems to be just taking the, you know, the straightforward route as prescribed by Simmons. In other words, he is trying to adhere to what you know, the plan is. Um, that is something that, of course, he's come under a lot of criticism for. And unfortunately, of course, as you may know, Paul, he doesn't survive. Um, he is killed. Yeah, he's killed in the assault. And he really becomes the, the focal point touchstone for this entire operation and uh, he becomes a real tragic figure in my opinion in uh, in this as well so i mean some people and i guess you know part of the counterfactual fun of being on location like this and when you're doing a tour is asking the people on the tour in this case the viewers if you're griffin what do you do do you follow orders into what apparently or conceivably could be a suicidal operation? Now, mind you, we are looking from hindsight. Um, or do you try to do something different? And by all accounts, they were trying desperately to let High Command know that this just wasn't on. But unfortunately, High Command does issue a direct order for them to continue. Now, the problem is, for most of us, you would probably say, well, <laughs> okay, um, you know, I can't do this, and you would suffer the consequences. But within the culture of the Black Watch, that is known to never say no under any circumstances, this is not considered, I mean, this is a threat to the honor of the regiment, a threat to the honor not only of the regiment currently, but all those who've come in the past. And that is a weight, that is an act around their necks that they can't get rid of. And so this becomes extremely important in their decision making, because all the officers, including Griffin, are sitting around debating this and they're saying, look, this shouldn't be on. But they can't figure out a way of getting out of it legally, if you will, where they could save face, save honor and not be court-martialed for disobeying a direct order. So then dutifully, they carry out those orders. 
And Griffin seems to be that kind of character who, come hell or high water, he's got enough sense of himself that he believes he's the best person to do this. And up until this point, you'd have to agree with him. And then, of course, once the battle starts, everything changes. So, you know, we're having the situation that they, they, Mag is saying that the skies there are kind of graying over. So we don't know how much longer we've got out before it starts chucking it down. Um, we'll, we'll see. But Duncan and Colin have met up now. They're in this, they're in the same location now. So they're, they're then are you, are you guys not too far away from Colin's van now? Are you, are you able to get out of it? Put your thumb up if you're kind of, is the sky yeah, we're okay? good. yeah, we're good. Um, Paul. Good. I'm about two minutes away, but we actually crossed to walk the battlefield, my walk. It was about three minutes and 50 seconds. And that right. was just a slow walk across the battlefield, just to give you an idea of the size of it. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Absolutely unbelievable. And there was nowhere to hide all the way across site. You know, no. even when kneeling down in the corn, they didn't stand a chance, God love them. They really didn't stand a chance. So I'll remind you again, the viewers, what Duncan's been doing. So he's, he's, just, he's gone the opposite way, but it was just the logistics of where we can get the cameras. He's been going this way from the start, his start point to his end point there. And they're both now Duncan and Colin in this area here, and their van is parked here. So if if it does start raining, uh, they can they can duck in. Maggie's in San Martin. She's going going to get us footage of the cemetery where David talked about the action there earlier. And there's some bullet holes and things in the village there we can get later on. Um, we're an hour and twenty minutes in, so we're time is um time is moving very fast, faster than I I thought really. So um, let let's get to the the the, the nitty gritty of of Griffin's decision and and. Alex Black, what uh, in his YouTube comments, he's saying that um, Gr Griffin deserves zero criticism. If he had succeeded, he would have got a DSO. So, um, you know, um, uh, he Sheldrake Six says Terry Cop has written that if Griffin had gone to May and cleared it, the whole perception of spring changes. And Alex then said yes, and it would have been a tough fight in May too, but not, maybe not wholesale slaughter. So it's Great. one of those issues that you know, you, it's it's that you know the uh, the what if scenarios is always very very difficult to come to any come to any conclusions well, on. Because yeah, but hang on, let me jump let me jump in on that one because sure. I don't think there was ever a genuine option of going into May. In other words, it makes perfect sense to do it, but given Simmons' caveat of going wide to keep going to maintain the schedule. There was no way that they were going to consider that moving into May was the correct approach based on what the boss was telling. You know what I mean? Yeah. So in other words, tactically, it makes perfect sense. Alex is absolutely right. Terry Pop's absolutely right. But the reality of the time and the context they found themselves, there was no way that they were going to adopt that unless they were given specific orders to do so. And the criticism of Simmons is this is the moment he should have shut Operation Spring down before they make the daylight assault up the mm. ridge. You've already poked the bear. They're coming after you. You know, the Germans already have taken the bait and they're coming. They're, you know, sending their battle groups across the Orn, um, which is what Dempsey wanted. He called it, you know, he was hoping to destroy a lot of the Panzers over the Orn by batting them back and forth. And it's a beautiful euphemism, he called it. He called it tennis over the Orn. So basically right. batting them back and forth. So that's what they were doing. So at that particular point, Simmons should have said, no, okay, go on to the defensive. Germans are coming, dig in, we will accomplish our objective. I suspect there was a bit more. This was Simmons' first big battle. And I think he was planning to deliver that ridge. As a matter of fact, he says that. He said, my expectation at very least was to deliver the ridge, which for him would put him probably up there with Sir Arthur Curry, who kept, you know, when it comes to the legends of Canadian military. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? He would have had his Vimy, you know? So there's much more going on than just simply, yeah, go to Mesa Orn. That makes absolutely perfect tactical sense, but not in the textual reality of what is happening at that time. And so, you know, as, you know, as we've just seen walking through that field, uh, there is no place to hide. So once you commit to going up that ridge, there is no turning back. You've got to keep going under come hell or high water and you've got to reach your objective. And that basically is the decision that, um, that uh, they reach, that we are going to go and it's going to be at all costs if necessary and we're going to push up over the ridge. We're going to hope that the artillery arrives on time, that the concentrations come down when it's supposed to on the first slope and that the armor is going to arrive when it does or when it's supposed to. Um, from what we can see, although it was controversial, 
And a lot of the survivors or the few survivors of the Black Watch assault claim that the artillery never arrived. The evidence I've seen in the message logs and elsewhere showed that it did, and it came down on the reverse slope, but it was an augmented plan from what it was supposed to be. So a lot of times they may not necessarily have noticed that you know there were artillery shells exploding on the reverse slope out of sight. Um, but there's no doubt that the tanks were late. The uh, tanks from the first Hazards um, got an order to not participate. So in other words, there must have been some talk early in the morning about this being shut down. And there was a mix up in communications. And it was only after the Black Watch started their advance up Verrier that the first Hazards were back in Saint-Martin, suddenly realized that they were on the move, and then they hoofed it to catch up. Uh, but they didn't catch up in sufficient time for the plan to come together. Again, all the moving parts, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so where you are now is actually the old church. Yeah. That's the old church yard in St. Martin. Um, a lot of people, when you're reading the history of this battle and you go to the church, don't go to the new one, okay? Because the new one wasn't there. This is the graveyard, the cemetery in St. Martin was the site of the church. The church was essentially destroyed in the fighting. It's where the um, trees are there. And Mag is showing a grave of someone clearly killed in the bombardments in 1944. So the, the church yeah. was, was where those trees are to the left there. There you go. And, um, the, yeah. the guys are heading back towards Saint-Martin now because of this fear of the rain coming their way. But um, okay. uh, just remind people watching that these, these events were happening 76 years ago, not quite for a minute. The events were kind of a bit early in the day, but basically we are yeah. doing this uh, in the same time of year, same day, just a few hours. Later. There's where the church was. So Mag's image there of the, of the, um, of the hedges Use. there is where the yeah. church, there are some, there are, there are the graves in the middle are of former priests who, who, who were buried yeah. in that church. And that's, that's San Martin. And I'm going to bring up that image I showed again from your PowerPoint there. Cause I think, this is a key image to now explain to people Griffin's Griffin's predicament and exactly when it all starts mm. going wrong because you can see there with the it, it's all it's all um everything is closing in that the walls of hell are cl uh, cl uh, closing in on Paul Griffin and his command there. Well, yeah, you're that's a good way of putting it. As a matter of fact, I you know one of my favorite books of all time is uh, Cornelius Ryan's Bridge Too Far for obvious reasons, and he had a chapter in there called Their Hexen Castle, which is called. Uh, when, of course, the Germans are closing in on the British paratroopers yeah. in, in Oosterbeek. And uh, I, I had to pay homage to him by using it here, because that's exactly what the Black Watch walk into, the witch's cauldron. And as soon as they give the order to move, and they start advancing roughly around 930, they start moving up the ridge, um, they come under fire immediately. First of all, it's sort of the typical, well, I'd argue it's, you know, it's, it's the playbook for the German. Um, they start dropping a curtain of uh, mortar fire behind the battalion as they're coming up. And now they're watching the Black Watch as they start to move up so they can see them. They have perfect, you know, uh, observation. And so they start dropping a curtain of, our, of uh, mortar fire behind to prevent any idea of retreating. And then the machine guns open up from the flanks. And it's fascinating because these machine guns have been sighted probably about knee level, and they've been sighted on fixed lines. So the Germans don't even have to be above ground. So basically, you can dig in your MG34 to 42s on tripods, and with a string, you can basically just sit down in your slip trench and pull the string for you know a burst here, a burst there, 5, 10, 15 seconds, whatever it is. And basically, you will get a streamline of machine gun fire going down. And it's not like in the movies where you see them, you know, traversing. It's just you're going to continue to fire on that line. And as the Black Watch are advancing, they're going to advance right into this line. And so some of the survivors have talked about the, game, the evil game of hopscotch, basically, where they mm -hmm. can see the fire coming through in front of them. And they're realizing it's not moving. It's just essentially coming in a steady line of bursts. And they are jumping over it and they're trying to make their way up the ridge. Now, the other thing, unfortunately, today, as you can see by the battlefield, we don't have the same kind of conditions when it comes to the wheat. Um, back in 1944, 76 years ago today, the wheat was pretty high because the Germans had evacuated the area a few weeks before and no harvesting. So when you're advancing up and you're dealing with waist high or shoulder high wheat, 
one of the tendencies with any new soldier or soldiers who are relatively green to combat is when you come under fire, you immediately go to ground, which is the worst thing to do. You, you know, the best thing to do in a situation like this is get up and over that ridge as fast as humanly possible. Because if you hunker down, you're going to die. The wheat may, you know, may hide you a little bit, but it's not going to protect you. No protection in the wheat from shells, shrapnel, machine gun fire. The other problem, too, is although the Black Watch are advancing and they're for the first, you know, I'd say few minutes, steady in their box formation, as soon as the fire starts coming in, men start to, you know, panic, bob, weave, command and control starts to break down because as men go down in the wheat, they can't see their commanders. And of course, you can't hear them either because of the battle that's raging. So the, as soon as the Black Watch start moving up, they essentially start to disintegrate. And as they're doing this, the Germans now are starting to lob shells. So you're having artillery fire coming in. You're having rockets coming down. And then basically by the time they reach the crest of the ridge, which is the yellow line right in the middle, out of the 320 men who start the assault and are moving just a couple of hundred meters up, and they're moving kind of in bounds, um, there's only about 60 left. And at this particular point, because everything has collapsed, Bill Griffin, who was in the middle of this box formation, has now just basically run to the front, and he's now taken personal command. And he's literally running from platoon to platoon, from you know individual man, etc., telling them to push on, move on, move on, move on. And a lot of ways, it the way it's been portrayed over the years is kind of like the, the charge of the light brigade that there's no hope left and this is it. But in reality, he's trying to do what you're supposed to do. Get the hell out of this no man's land as quick as possible and get to your objective. And so it's not necessarily just this, you know, last, you know, uh, last gasp hurrah. But it's the only possible thing at that horrible moment that you can do as a commander is yeah. trying to get your men up. Now, the sad part is only about 60 make the other side right into the German killing zone. And so as they crest the ridge and descend, they're annihilated. Griffin, from the accounts we have, uh, ends up issuing an order, perhaps him or uh, one of the uh, forward observation officers, a guy by the name of Gordon Powitz, who was the only other officer left standing. He wasn't even Black Watch. He was with the artillery. Um, there was an order issued, like literally beyond the 11th hour, to pull out. In other words, whoever's left, make it back the way you can. Uh, apparently, at that moment, Griffin turns and steps on a shoe mine, and he's blown up and he's killed. And so that essentially ends the Black Watch attack. So out of the 320 men who make the attack, only 20 report fit for duty the next day. Now, <laughs> you can imagine if you're the support company commander, a man by the name of uh, Ronnie Bennett, Captain Ronnie Bennett, who was the nephew of the former Canadian prime minister, R.B. Bennett, um, he, his job was to wait in Saint-Martin with all the uh, battalion carriers, stocked with ammunition, water, food, rum, believe it or not, they were able to get some rum, uh, not to mention the mortars, the anti-tank guns, everything else. He's been under constant fire. A lot of his carriers have been knocked out. And then suddenly the four rifle companies make their advance and no one hears from them. Nothing. They just disappear. No radio messages, nothing. And he's expecting to rush up and join them. And now suddenly he realizes, uh-oh, you know, I, where have they gone? There's nobody on the radio. He can't raise anybody. And then suddenly he's getting indications that the Germans are coming. And of course, that's exactly what's happening. Germans are now starting to launch their assault to reclaim their main defense line, which is on uh, Varia Ridge. This is standard. The Germans do this all the time. This yeah, is what they're yeah. called for, right? So that's what they do. So now Bennett takes what's left of the Black Watch, and I'm not talking about the guys who made the assault. There's only a couple of them trickling back. But basically, he grabs... What I call the odds and sods. Actually, I shouldn't say that. He called it the odds and sods. In other words, you know, he took the uh, the baker, the candlestick maker, the shoemaker, and everything else. Any anybody who was supporting in support positions in the battalion. Some guys probably hadn't fired a rifle in anger ever, let alone uh, in training for a while. And 
they consolidated in St. Martin in three buildings. So farmyard, and there you go, right there. And that's, and, that, and that's exactly where Duncan is now. And we're we're being t- warned by Mag that they're about five minutes away from, from perfect the coming. So um, well, this is great that you're inside. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. Th- these are the barns where the Black Watch were about to make what they thought was going to be their last stand. And for the next 24 hours, they are trapped in this farmyard as the Ninth SS, mostly the battle groups from the Ninth SS. Um, come swarming down the ridge. Uh, Kempf Group, Zollhofer, and Meyer come swarming down the ridge and back into St. Martin. And as a result, the SS are all over the place. They know that the, what's left of the Black Watch or the Canadian unit is in this area. Yeah, you can see the shell damage up there. Where, uh, where the camera is right now was actually the basement, and they had prepared this entire area. I mean, they went to work real quick. Uh, in getting this ready to sustain any type of attack. I mean, they tried to turn this into as, as much of a fortress as humanly possible. I mean, everything from ripping out furniture, filling bathtubs, you know, anything else they could, not, you know, knocking holes in the uh, in the ceilings for uh, communication or even, you know, last ditch attack, you dump grenades down, you know, if, if the Germans penetrate. I mean, that's the kind of um, uh, urgency that is prevalent at that time, that has completely slipped through all Canadian history books. Nobody understands what is happening or has really looked into it at this time. And you can see the heavy battle damage. And so in the basement uh, or the cellar, that's where they set up the makeshift aid post. And, um, you know, you had the Black Watch regimental uh, 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 medical officer who was working like crazy on the wounded who were coming in. But then you also have the snipers. And this is sort of the gist of the book, The Rise of the Black Watch Snipers, the only effective unit left in the battalion that can put up any kind of defense is the 22-man scout sniper platoon. And so they're parceled out around this area and basically it now becomes a game, a tense waiting game for when the Germans are going to try to squeeze them out. And that starts unfolding very late on the night of the 25th into the 26th. As a matter of fact, the Germans... Are, are they they pull up a couple of tanks they run some tanks behind the lines they're playing a psychological game and they're trying to scare them either into submission or just terrify them just before that final coup de grace. and sure enough they come in and they try to attack and um you know under the command of bennett with the help of uh, george butch b-u-c-h by the way who was his pioneer platoon commander um the black watch or what's left of them these odds and sods put up one fantastic defense and uh, you know i would argue one of the most uh, one of the most heroic defenses in of many heroic defenses in the battle for varia ridge at that time and this is the stuff that you know for the point of what we're doing here world war ii TV, and by the way folks we have got permission to film in this farm we spoke to the farmer a few days ago and he said that the, the, that particular farm had been hit by shelling from the from the navy on june the 6th uh, from wiesner mm-hmm. is what he said and that's when he put a, a big hole through the back wall they've changed things now they've put some extra doorways in there um and this is you know alex black is reminding us and i, I was going to say it anyway this is the, this particular part of the battle this final stand while well, the rain is coming now is exactly what sets your work apart david from the previous work on on mm-hmm. the barrier ridge because We've seen documentaries going back 20 years about, you know, the valor and the horror and all that, the mm. drama in the wheat field, which, of course, is an, an integral part of the battle. But it wasn't over. And this oh. final stand here is, you know, your sniper's story or the work you've done is exceptional. And I urge people to, to, if you haven't got David's book, get it, get it. And we're going to do some more work with David in the future. In November, his second edition of his Diep book comes out and we can talk about that on a special show. But this is where these last stands took place. And... Um, yeah, I, I feel we did kind of have to kind of change things a bit because of the potential of the, of the rain. But it, it looks like we've made it. It's raining now, but it didn't rain when they're out in the wheat, wheat field. So uh, um, yeah. I'm pleased that we managed to keep our camera crews uh, dry because um, I don't care about yeah. Duncan. He's a Scots Guardsman, but Mag will get grumpy because she's a, she's um, um, it doesn't like getting wet. Colin will get grumpy because he's Irish, and they, they although they do like the rain though, Colin. So I don't know. I don't know. Why I'm, I don't know. I'm making Guardsman don't anyway. get wet. Come on. But, yeah, so this is this is where this final stand took place. So I think your summary was was perfect there, and I think the people watching this, I I, I have um, 
I think we've got across just the losses that this poor Patan uh, suffered in this in this this terrible day. So there's that image again. I'll show it of of these buildings, and that's exactly where we're filming. Of course, since this photo, this aerial photo was taken, a lot has changed there. The the uh, the farm is still there, but the houses left and right have, have all kind of changed now. But this is where all this action took place. And, and there's another image in, in David's presentation of the um, the officers, and that's obviously wounded and killed. Um, and if that doesn't get across what lost is, but had, then nothing yeah. will. I showed a similar image of the C Company's roll of the rifles from my great uncle's unit a few days ago, a few days ago in the Shamwood show. And it was not as bad as this. It was about 60% losses. This is, this is, well, what are, you know, that, that's. About 94%, 94% losses. I mean, that, from a Canadian perspective, you know, that puts it up there with anything on the first day of the Somme. You know, that's the Royal New Zealand Regiment. I mean, maybe not in total numbers, but certainly in the percentage. And of course it changes, you know, one would argue it changes the culture of the Black Watch forever. Yeah. You know, it's no longer just simply a Montreal unit, if you will, you know? Mm. Because after that, they got to rebuild and they have to rebuild in a hurry. And, and where are you going to get the officers from? Because you have a shortfall. And because of the can loan program, we British have been nicking all your best officers for the last few months. So, uh, you know, yeah. replacing that number of well, commanders. Yeah, um, for the Black Watch, it wasn't too bad because, like I said, the Black Watch become kind of a Canadian Army mafia. <laughs> right, so, okay. you know, so they, they've been husbanding away their resources. So when it comes to officers, it's not bad. But when it comes to the men in the ranks, um, there's a lot of fuss at home that they're not black watch trained if you will because they're coming from all different parts so there's a, a healthy or unhealthy way of looking at you know regimental traditions and regimental attitude you know things have changed dramatically in 76 years i will attest maggie's saying she doesn't mind the rain she just uh she's sending me private messages i was trying to keep you safe dear that's all um well, but it is it is getting a bit, a bit inclement there so um there is Duncan showing us some images there of the, still the bullet holes around the uh, around the, the doorways and the buildings there. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's a pretty a pretty grim yeah. grim day. It's amazing. And, I mean, I really didn't understand the impact of this um, until about 15 years ago when we did the documentary there. And um, when just like now, we were given permission to go in and we took a look around. And um, one of the farmers who we did meet, who has moved on to a different farm was a young boy. Now he wasn't there at the time uh, because they had evacuated the area, but they snuck back very quickly. And when they arrived, they could see that the cellar had been used quite obviously as a, as a, uh, as a aid station or a makeshift morgue in some cases, you know, at one particular point, the black watch who had taken heavy casualties in uh, Mesa or in uh, St. Martin actually had started to stack up the dead in that farmyard kind of like cordwood getting mm. ready for burial um and of course you know it was only a couple of weeks later when they actually figured out what had happened to the four, uh, the four companies went up the ridge it was only around august 13th after operation totalized and the ridge finally fell into canadian hands that they were able to recover the remains and that's where they were able to put two and two together of what the advance had been like because you could see where the majority of dead were and then there was another clump on the other side of the ridge as well. And mm. so it was, uh, you know, the snipers were involved in, in remains recovery, which is probably the grimmest task that you could ever yeah, not good. call upon to do, you know, going up and picking up the remains of your buddy. You know, I, 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 I feel for anybody. And there's plenty of people, sadly, over the last, you know, 15 years who have, you know, suffered that in, uh, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan. And, you know, my heart goes out to you. Well, I think we're going to start wrapping things up fairly shortly. And uh, uh, Mag was giving us some images of the cemetery there, and but I wasn't using them all the time because I was showing Duncan's images. It's very tricky in these situations to try and manage all the camera angles, things like yeah. that. But I think we've done a pretty good job. It, we, with the with the weather has been a consideration. Um, it's I think we've shed some light on this. I mean, obviously, some of the Canadians watching this, like Alex, they they know this story intimately. I think some of the Brits, like Martin Harley, watching a are less familiar with this and um it's it's shed some light on a very a yeah. very costly day for everybody involved and um thank you david for for sharing this this brilliant observations and insight into this battle i've learned a lot during this show and um we we kind of in the end been slightly beaten by the weather but um 
uh, when they, the guys drive off, we might get some final images of the reconstructed village of yeah. San Martin. And, and, the, and unfortunately for the village, it didn't, it didn't end there because the bombing continued in August, allied bombing. And uh, as we yeah. tried to push the advance south and totalize and tractable happen, as you drive around these areas, you get monuments to, to the next operations as well, because these villages saw, saw um, three or four advances come through them, advances. Uh -huh. And, and yes. so, um, and I think sort of to bring it back full circle to where you started off with about interconnecting all these battles interconnect, what happened out of Operation Spring, even though it was a failure, um, the Germans did react and it pinned them to Verrier Ridge for a crucial few days. And what was happening on the same day, of course, across on the American sector was they had finally launched Operation Cobra. Of course, yeah. And because the Germans were tied up here, it gave the American First Army the breathing room to maintain their momentum, which eventually led to breakout on the 27th. And so even though that was not necessarily intended, it did have, I guess you could say, um, you know, a, a relatively successful outcome despite the horrific cost. And I think also we've got some more tan shows coming up on August the 7th. I have a, a sort of sneaking suspicion that this can, this German um, success that day maybe is one of the, the, the factors that prompts um, uh, you know, Hitler and von Kluger to think about Operation Lutich. They've been on a defensive only campaign for several weeks and they've now actually been driving north and pushing back the Canadians and maybe it just proves to the Germans that there is there is still some potential for an offensive. Um, you know, you, you, you kind of have to connect a lot of dots to, to connect those two battles, but certainly, as you said, it has an effect on Cobra, it has an effect on um, uh, the Germans' confidence, I suppose, over the next few days. And Duncan is showing us some final few bullet holes there. Oh, yeah, that's marks, what's called like, Shell Alley. Yeah, this yeah. Is, yeah, the very uh, Rue de Verrier, which is Shell Alley or Bomb Alley. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's if there's not that much to see compared to some battles because of the reconstruction, because of the, the, the mm -hmm. modern houses going in. But there are bits and pieces here and there. And um, we'll um, we'll close things off fairly shortly. But I mean, as Alex Black is saying on the comments, you know, the worst day for the Canadian army, apart from Dieppe in, in Northwest yep. Europe. And um, and it, it's been fascinating going through the various stages of it and the uh, the the. The, the, I don't want to use the word mistakes because mistakes and failures always implies, you know, human frailties. I think it's mm -hmm. reactions to situations that maybe could have been better, perhaps is a better mm -hmm. way of looking at it. And, a very, and as we always say, attacking is very difficult in Normandy. Uh, even if you yeah. outnumber the enemy, moving across open ground is very, very hard. Yeah. And the Germans are very, very good at defending that ground. Yeah. And so things are never going to work perfectly. And this is an example of, of, of the allies being knocked a little bit. They're quite there. They've had, they've been gradually get building up a little bit of a head of steam, you know, um, Goodwood yeah. hasn't, hasn't been a success as such, but it kind of a draw maybe um, there's, there's some confidence been building. We've been building up our forces we've been building our airfields. And this is a reminder that the Germans still have a hell of a lot of fight left. And um yeah. There's another and it's also very easy for us to sit, you know, 76 years later in the comfort of our homes and engage in a discussion about hindsight. You know, it's very difficult. And that's what I try to do in my work is I try to get into the heads of the commanders on the day and be balanced and fair to them. Uh, but at the end of the day, you got to go where the evidence takes you and you've got to weigh it appropriately. So, you know, that's part and parcel of my approach as well. But without a doubt, at the end of the day, history is about empathy. It's all about, yeah. you know, ensuring that you walk in somebody else's shoes so you can get an idea of what it was like. Yeah, I mean, you hit the nail on the head there. Sitting and second guessing and talking about it from our comfy chairs is interesting. And it's always it's mm. always um, uh, open to debate. But of course, when you're there in the field and Griffin takes over on that very that day and that there's a command issue and, you know, as, uh, and and. You know, he's buried in Bre Breadville Soleil Cemetery, which on another day we'll do a show from there and talk about some of these men, perhaps have you back on David and walk around the cemetery and, and talk about some of the men and, and, and highlight some of their personal stories. But it's, you know, it's, 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 it is it's comparatively easy to, 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 to say, oh, well, we should have done that. They should have done this. And but that's not the nature of it. It's, um, you know, it's, um, yeah. No, so anyway, the, well, the job of the historian is to tell it as it was and secondary, tell it how it should have been. Yeah, you know yeah. What I, mean? I mean that's how we learn, and that's how we can, we can, we can move forward. But we we must always, you know, doff our hats to those men that have to make have to pay the price for these learning curves. Right. And, and warfare is a very very steep learning curve. Well, they're back inside the vehicle now, so it looks like they're going to head off now uh, back home. And um, 
I think you've got another belt of rain coming your way, but you're driving now, so that's okay. So there, oh. we're just seeing that final shot there, Duncan driving back through the, the, the largely restored San Martin now. And as David said, the modern church there, which is not a terribly attractive one, it's one of those kind of, you know, concrete 1950s, 60s things, is has been moved away from the site of the original one which was in the cemetery where the battle damage is that Mag kindly shown us. So um, sterling work, my camera team. Thank you, Mag. Yeah, thank you, really. Duncan. Thank you, Colin, for driving. Thank you, Francois, I think, is there as well, just adding some moral support. And all these guys are tour guides. They can take you around these battlefields and show you these places when, when travel is possible again. And I'm going to put it back on the, the, the four screens again, and, and we'll bring this to an end. So for those watching, um we've got our shows coming up the battle of the north atlantic show coming up on the 29th with mark milner another incredible canadian historian uh we have um, brian walter an american historian and we've got ian ballantyne talking about u-boats and wolf packs and all that kind of thing and the happy time and the second happy time that's coming up and then the, there's our warsaw show on august the first and our mortan show on august the seventh and we're going to try and do something the next week i'm not sure yet what we're going to do and then Falaise Gap in August, later in August. But we've got lots of things coming up, but they need they need prep, they need planning, and we need they need thinking about. Mm. But David, your knowledge has been exceptional. I mind people watching again that the, the book there, Seven Days in Hell, is absolutely worth getting. Um, and I'm not just saying that because he kindly appeared on the show. It is a cracking book. And um, so and if any final words in, in the, uh, from, from you yourself, David? Well, I just, you know, part of it is I got to thank you. I mean, when you approached me a couple of weeks ago and you explained to me how you were doing this, I mean, I've been working in television now for about 20 years as a historian, and I know the kind of crew it takes. And you obviously have a hell of a crew with you. But for most of you sitting at home, you probably don't realize that Paul is juggling about 17 balls right now as we're doing this. Yeah. And so, Paul, you know, my hat's off to you. You do a fantastic job. It's, it's enjoyable to do this, and particularly under conditions like this, I think you're doing a fantastic job. So well, thank you up. very much. And um, you know, I was trying to be to take care of the camera. People didn't get too wet as well. So anyway, that's that's. We'll bring it to an end. Don't forget to click subscribe. Don't forget to uh, get the notifications of future films. And um, we'll we'll be again soon. So if you'd like to support what we're doing, the Patreon link is below. Um, David's got a, a books out. You can buy websites. He teaches history all the time. I say Duncan, Mag, Francois, and Colin all tour guides. So this is me, Paul Woodadge, saying thank you very much for listening. It's been a fantastic show. I've learned a lot during the preparation. It's, the conversations in the sidebar have been fascinating. Alex Black, Sheldrake, Martin, all these guys. You could just film the conversations. I think it would make a show in its own right. But we could always come back and do a, dis a panel discussion with some Canadian mm -hmm. historians about the development of Canadian tactics in Normandy and, and look at people like Simmons and their relationship with Dempsey and Monty and all those kind of people and Keller and all those figures there's definitely some room for some discussion there but anyway that's enough for today we've been nearly at two hours so thank you very much everyone for watching and um i'm ending the stream and we'll see you all again soon uh, enjoy your weekend thank you thanks everybody have a good one